Son of Man be lifted up, and whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned. But those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their, de that their deeds have been done in God. The gospel is International Women's Day, Women's Month. Ms. Linda Harris, who is a single songwriter and the director of the Harry Tubman Museum and Education Center in Cambridge, Maryland. And Mr. David Cole, Composer, writer, arranger, performer, educator, and also the guitar instructor at the Duke Ellington School of Performing Arts in Washington, D.C. So I introduce you, Ms. Linda Harris, who is David Cole. I am absolutely honored and delighted to be here. When I walked in the door, like my grandfather's church in North Carolina. When we talk about mothers, I loved, I adored my grandmother. She, uh, we, they lived on a farm when my father went to uh, fight in the Korean War. They, he left us at my grandmother's and grandfather's farm. So I know how to pluck, I know how to wring a chicken's neck, all right, put him in boiling water and pull those feathers off. <laughs> I know how to slop hogs. Yeah. And my most favorite, there were two favorite things I, I was able to do was she would make this uh, grape wine and she'd put the grapes in this barrel and I'd get in that barrel and I'd mash up those grapes with my feet. <laughs> Other wonderful thing she did is she taught me how to quilt. We would take pieces of material and make these squares and make quilts. Little did I know at that time that she was preparing me for the life that I live now. I can survive in any kind of environment. Amen. I can circulate around any kind of people, no matter status, color, and I'm comfortable because I carry with her, carry in me the love that she, she gave me. Now she bore my mother who was also a fantastic woman. I used to give her trouble when I was a little girl. <laughs> she used to say I was obstinate. I didn't know what obstinate meant, really, until I took my SATs, and that was one of the words I got right. <laughs> uh, but she was an amazing woman. Uh, oh, she never worked, and there were six of us in the family, and she took care of us. She laid the groundwork for who we became. And we all are pretty good human beings, and I'm grateful for that. So that ties me into Harriet Tubman. Oh, my gosh. Women, right? Without women, there'd be no men. There'd be nothing. <laughs> nothing. So I was drawn to the story of Harry Tubman. I, I lived uh, I live in Mitchellville, but I had a company in D.C. called uh, Carson Properties. And for 33 years, I developed housing cooperatives for low to moderate income families. I'm very proud of that because now the properties that they bought are worth millions of dollars. So we got all these little millionaires living in D.C. now. And I'm very excited about that. I retired in 2019. And I turned the business over to my son. And I had started taking uh, music lessons, piano and singing, you know, and I went to New York and New Orleans to work singing. Uh, and then 2020 came. 2020 changed our lives, right? We are, we are different. We will forever be different because of 2020. Our families were dying off, and they were killing black men and women. And it really frightened me. It paralyzed me. And so I, I, um, I remember watching the coverage of George Floyd uh, one night in May. It was 24-hour coverage, as you can remember. And I, I was frightened. I felt like my freedom was gone. I was frightened to be outside, actually. 
So my dad had given me a book, also an amazing man, but we're not talking about him today. <laughs> <laughs> but he was amazing. Um, he had given me a book about Harriet Tubman when I was 10 years old. And while I was watching TV, it was about 2 in the morning, that book began to glow. And I went over, it's like it was beckoning me to come and pick it up, you know, after all these years. I didn't even know why I still had it. But again, I was being prepared for what I do now. Yeah, I'm like, let me come out and join you. I'm not one to. And so the book started going. I went over and I picked it up. And the book was entitled Runaway Slave. And it was a children's book about Harriet Tubman. I read it. And I read it. Oh my God, this is a sign. So that was on a Thursday night. Friday morning, I get in my car. No, nope, there was no traffic on the road. You could walk down the middle of 50, 395, 495. So I drove to Cambridge. I got there in about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when I got there, I went to the uh, Harriet Tubman, uh, there was no, the um, Cambridge Visitor Center. And uh, it was open. I called. The lady wouldn't let me come in, COVID, you know, masking and all that. But she came out. And she sat at a bench with me for about two hours and we talked about Harry Tubman. Then she introduced me. I ended up spending the night and I met a bunch of historians. And they talked to me about the story. So I said, ah, the way I can restore my freedom is to walk the Underground Railroad. So in 2020, I, st I started training in May, June. I'd walk two miles, turn into five, 10, 15. And one day, I walked 20 miles. I was so absorbed with the, the environment and the story of our ancestors who had only their feet to take them to, to glory, to, to take them to freedom. And I said, you know what, I can do this. So in September 2020, I, I walked with seven other women. I put a post on Facebook, who wants to walk with me along the Underground Railroad? To my great surprise, 20 women responded. So I said, okay, if we're going to do this, you got to train. You have to, you have to strengthen your core because walking, yes, you need good shoes, you need some strong legs, which I have like a my see. I was always being prepared for what I have to do now. Who knew that? Um, but I said, you got to really strengthen your core. So the first time we met was on a weekend, and I, I took them to Great Falls. Does anyone know Great Falls? Yeah. And I took them on the Billy Goat Trail. Mm -hmm. And the Billy Goat Trail, you have to walk and climb, and pull yourself up on these rocks. Two of the women said, I should sue you. What, why, why would you bring us out here to do this? I said, I'm trying to prepare you for a journey of a lifetime. So not, needless to say that 20 dwindled to seven, so eight of us walked. So in September, we walked from Cambridge, uh, Maryland, all the way to Philadelphia. I've done it uh, three times since then. And I will continue to do it, because Harriet Tubman did it 13 times. So I want to tell you the story of Harriet Tubman. I'm sure many of you know it. But her, um, her grandmother, we'll start with her grandmother, was captured on the west coast of Africa and gone. She was pregnant at the time. She was and she was put, uh, shackled, and put in the belly of slave ship. Portuguese slave traders. And these human beings, these Africans, vibrant, amazing people, were put at the belly of the slave ship, shat, uh, stacked like books on a bookcase, shackled wrists, shackled ankles, and made to endure a horrific journey that took sometimes three months. Now they came from different, uh, from Ghana, there's many uh, languages, right? So they couldn't even communicate with each other. But what they had was the sound of their poem, the beat of your heart. That's the first sound. It's the very basis of the music that we know of. They brought that music. The sounds in nature, the sounds of the bird, the, the birds, the, the waves, the motion of the ocean. These are sounds that the Africans brought with them to these United States shores. And they weren't welcome. They were brought here for one specific purpose, and that was to toil sun up to sundown to make the enslavers insanely wealthy. And what separates us from them is they have generational wealth that we didn't get because we labored for that. So I'm going to take you back to the sound. When we talked about the QR code, we came here with all kinds of codes. In fact, I'm, I'm, I feel very comfortable saying that everything that has happened uh, in terms of inventions in America came from us. So remember that study of history. I'm sure I'm speaking. Speech, uh, speeching, uh, 
preaching to the choir right now, mm -hmm. I can tell mm -hmm. this to young people. But everything that this country is, is because of our contributions. Mm -hmm. So I want to take you back, if you can close your eyes and imagine. I mean, every time I think about it, it's, it's frightening, but it's also liberating to know that our ancestors were put on those ships, brought to these shores, and survived because we are here. Mm. We are here to tell the story, and we must continue to tell it every single day. Mm. So you're on this ship. You've been taken from your families. You've been taken from the motherland. Your mothers, your fathers, and you're, you know, the, the, the hull of that slave ship is dark. Mm. And all you know is your culture and the sounds that you brought with you. You hear your heart, heart beating, you hear your breath. You just took in breath to, to get started this morning. Right? And so you're, you begin to hum. Mm -hmm. She bores 
Harriet Green. Harriet Green is Harriet Tubman's mother. Now, Harriet Tubman was born Araminta Ross, and her nickname was Menti. But Menti, there's a woman named Sarah Bradford that uh, interviewed Harriet Tubman. And she says, and she talked fondly. She tells us, Sarah, how fond she was of her grandmother, the ancestors, right? And her grandmother used to talk to her about them, and the Guyan principles and cultures. So this little girl grew up with that. And I mention that because I grew up with what my grandmother taught me, you understand? Without her, I would be nothing. And without my mother, I'd be nothing. So the, the lessons that we learn from our mothers and fathers, I'm not just kidding. <laughs> but this is, this, is, this, is, <laughs> this is International Women's Month. So our mothers, are, it's good stuff. I mean, it's good stuff. I, this pinky ring, before my mother died, I said, Mom, you know, I, I want this ring. She took it off of her finger before she died. And she put it on my pinky. And I don't take this ring because she's with me every single day. But every time it's just, she grew up with a strong grandmother who survived that journey. Can you imagine me? Pregnant? Oh my God. They, there were women who were pregnant on, that, on, the, on those slave ships and they gave birth and they died and the babies died too. But Harry Tubman's grandmother survived. So she bore Harry Tubman's mother, uh, whose name was also Harry. And then here, here comes Harry Tubman, born 1822. She's one of uh, nine children. She's the fifth of nine children. She had four older brothers, uh, four, I'm sorry, four older sisters and four brothers. So they endured this harsh system of slavery. Now from very young, remember Harry has been listening to her grandmother and she's saying, you know, Girl, you came from another place. This isn't where you're from. And you can't stay in this system of slavery. This thing is not good for us. It's not who we are. Mm. So from very young, Harry understood, or Minty understood, I gotta be free. I gotta get back to the mother. So from her, her whole existence, she was, she never, she got beaten off, and she only grew to be five feet. So she was a <laughs> tiny little girl, right? But she was always questioning this system of slavery. And as a result of that, she was always whipped off. And the brothers were whipped off. The Brodises, who uh, eventually uh, purchased, after Harry's grandmother died, the mother was purchased by the Brodis family. The families in Cambridge, Maryland, uh, they were all related. Sestuous bunch, bunch. The cousins married cousins. And they did all of that to keep the land in the family and the enslaved people in the family. So the Brodises, she grew up with the Brodises. Her father, Benjamin Ross, uh, was enslaved on another plantation, the Thompson's Plantation, and that's about 35 miles from the Brodus Plantation. Her mother and father married in 1808, and the importance of that date, 1808, is when slave ships were prohibited from coming to the United States shores. Legally, didn't mean they weren't coming, but legally they were prohibited. So Maryland became this breeding ground. They were breeding human beings because by about 1830, the cotton, cotton was king and we needed to send bodies down south to pick that cotton. It made the folks very, very wealthy. It was the fourth largest industry in the world at that time. So Harriet is not, she's there, she's dealing with this, being beaten off and had very harsh jobs as a little girl. One of them, uh, when she was about five, she had to go and check the traps of muskrat. They, they eat muskrats. You, know, you have to think about what people eat and how it affects their minds. So, eat muskrat is something wrong. <laughs> so she, one of her jobs is, you know, she had to go into the icy Blackwater River. They had to do it during the winter time. No shoes now, and check the traps. Now, and if the traps were empty, she would be severely beaten. And she's only five. Another very harsh job was when her, when the, her enslaver, Edward Brodus Jr., uh, senior, I'm sorry, died. He left everything to his son, Edward Brodus Jr. And uh, the mother, his mother, Edward Brodus Jr.'s mother, married a t the Thompson uh, family who enslaved uh, Harriet Tubman's father, Benjamin Ross. So when the new Thompson woman had a new baby, they scooped up Harriet and said, your job is to keep the baby. Keep the baby quiet. Now, all the babies <laughs> They need to be changed. They're hungry. And they just want to But the enslaver wives, they couldn't be bothered. We raise their children. 
They didn't do a good job. They raised their children. And so Herod's job, if the baby cried, if the baby cried, she would be severely beaten. Now she's eight, she's a baby herself. A little tiny thing, right? So she, she endures that, and finally the Thompson woman, she uh, says, Harriet's no good, she can't keep the baby quiet. So she sends her back to the Rose Plantation. And that is the last time that Harriet Tubman works inside of the house. The rest of her 27 years on the Eastern Shore, she is out working the fields. But what she's doing is she is observing she becomes a naturalist. She understands the land. She becomes an astronomer. She understands the sky. And the other thing that's unique about the Eastern Shore and the, and the slave system there is the uh, enslavers didn't have the same number of, of slaves as they did in the South. Mm -hmm. Sometimes some plantations were huge. They could have hundreds of enslaved people. But on the Eastern Shore, there were much smaller farmhouses. And the greatest number any enslaver had, Dr. Thompson being the biggest enslaver, had about 50. So what they were doing is renting their slaves out between the plantations. So of course, in order for the enslaved people to get from one plantation to the other, they had to walk. But they are observing their environment. Because the, from the time they were put on those slave ships, the objective was always to get to freedom. So they're walking, they're seeing the land, the trees, they understand what's going on. When Harriet Tubman leaves at age 27, she knows to follow the North Star. In the northern sky, in the winter, the most, there are two prevalent constellations in the sky. Big Dipper, the Little Dipper. And at the base of that constellation is Polaris, the North Star. So Harry, knowing what her grandmother told her, knowing the relationship that the Guyanese people had with the land and the sky, and she knew that if she was walking and that star was in front of her, she was wondering. So there's a cut, they, they communicated. This Underground Railroad was a system of people, free blacks, abolitionists, Quakers, locations, safe houses along the way, and there were so many safe, safe houses that we're now discovering. And codes, code songs. Of course we sing, because that's what we know. We realize that the beat of our heart is what consoles us and what saves us. So there's a song called Follow the Drinking Gourd. The Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, where the, the, and the uh, stars at the base of it resembles a ladle or a drinking gourd. So there's a song now, the historians, and historians are always fighting with me, okay? I'm not a historian, I'm just a woman who's very passionate about who I am and my ancestors, and nobody who's read works of other white folks, and I'm not a racist, but I'm just telling you, can tell me what runs through my veins. And this music that we now know that's been copywritten in these books in the 1900s, they came from us. The lyrics may have been changed, but the rhythms are our rhythms. So I have all these fancy, dancy historians from all these Ivy League schools. I went to a seminar once, and I, I get invited, you know, because I'm not. <laughs> really solid in who I am and what I believe. And when you are solid, everybody wants to talk to you. All right, so they have me in these, these conferences all the time. I'll just tell you this real quick, and I'll get back to David is playing a song. David accused me. He says I talk too much. But <laughs> so I was in this conference, all these Ivy League PhDs, and I, PhDs are good. I don't have them, and it's okay. So, <laughs> so this one woman gets up from this, you know, one of the, one of the most prominent Ivy League schools. I won't mention it. And she says, Harriet Tubman couldn't have done what she did. She couldn't read her work. So there's about 40 people in the room, two African Americans, me and one other lady, who happens to be a PhD. So I'm looking at her, thinking she's going to say something. <laughs> she didn't say anything, so I said, okay. All right, here, it's me. <laughs> so I stood up and I said, nope, she could read and write the King's English. I bet you don't know it all that well either. But what she came with was a kind of passion and intelligence and intuition that you simply can't know about because it doesn't run through your veins. There was a lull over the room. I'm standing there proudly. So we went, you know, we finished with the conference and the history of Harry Tubman. And at the end of the conference, the woman came over to me and she apologized. And I said, thank you very much. Because I am sick and tired of you guys telling me about so, I felt very proud about that. But now, people call me all the time to speak. It's just, it's just incredible. And I love it. I love, I love it so much. So, Henry Tubman, the uh, Underground Railroad went as far south as Mexico, far north as Canada, far west as Utah, and all the areas in between.
part of an archaeological dig in Canaan right now. I, I get down with the archaeologist. <laughs> and you know, you put, you get the, you gather the dirt, and you put it in a sifter, and you shake it and sift it out until you see what's in the dirt, and you get these artifacts. So I'm just excited about all the things that Harriet is putting in the place, places to do. It's just incredible. But so when they are traversing this underground railroad, they communicate through code. So this drinking code, follow the drinking code. If you look it up, it was copywritten in 1928 and then again in 1948. They say it's written by this white guy down in Texas. But I want you to listen to these words. And I want you to think about why this white guy in Texas would be writing about the drinking board had he not heard it. In fact, I read, I read a little deeper about him. He heard his old Auntie Anna singing this song. Where did his old Auntie Anna get the song? All right? Okay, Dave, I'm ready. Dynamics and the, the, uh, the 
generations there, 50% of the African Americans in Cambridge, in the, on the Eastern Shore, not just Cambridge, but other parts of the Eastern Shore, were free. And they were free because they had been, when the first people, the first indentured slaves were brought here in 1619, they were brought to Virginia. There's this great book, 1619, if you don't have it, get it. Thank you forever to read it, but it's a, a great book. But they were brought here in uh, 1619. There was a population explosion in, in the next century, and that there was a point in Virginia, there were more blacks than whites, and the white folks got frightened. So they sent black folks to Maryland, and when they came here, they were free. All right. So in, on the eastern shore between Dorchester and Caroline County, you had enslaved people, and you had free blacks. And Harriet's always moving around. She's quite a network from very young. Uh, so she said, you know, how come you're free and I'm not? So the free blacks uh, were very instrumental in helping uh, enslaved blacks get above the So, uh, and John was free. And now I don't know if Harriet married him because uh, she thought she could get her freedom. But at that time, women couldn't get their freedom. Uh, men could buy their freedom, but women, women could not. And if, if they joined in marriage and had children, the children would always be enslaved. So uh, Harriet wants to leave. John is saying, well, you know, I'm not I, I going on here. I don't need to go anywhere. And he didn't want her to go. And he says, if you go, you know, you're gone. Uh, so she said, OK, OK, John. I got to do what I have to do. And so she walked to freedom in 1849. But she gets there. She meets a man named William Still, another incredible human being. Uh, he's an abolitionist. He, his mother had been born on the Eastern Shore and without freedom. And uh, he helps her find work and lodging. I don't know if you saw the movie Harry, but his role is very prominent mm -hmm. in that movie. Uh, but she gets there, and uh, she's not happy. She's not happy because she left John behind. And she left her family. So it was important for her. This is visionary. She freed a nation. She freed a people. That she come back, not just once or twice or three times, she came back 13 times to endure that perilous journey. Now, when I walked the Underground Railroad, I got to tell you this funny story. I met with consultants from REI, the outdoor place, and they sat down with me and told me what shoes I needed to endure this 158 mile journey, the kind of outerwear I needed. I had a water bag, snacks, everything. And if I got lost, I had my phone. I could GPS the direction. <laughs> Harry didn't have that. The enslaved people didn't have that. All they had were their hearts and their desire. Did God get them right to be free? And that's what makes them want their journey. And I had the audacity to say I couldn't make it by the third day. I, told, I was telling the ladies, you know, I have this tough woman pushing you every day. I didn't want it. The third day, I was exhausted. We were walking 20 miles each day. But the morning of the third day, I got up and was staying in, in hotels. I wanted to camp. They, they, they were having no, nothing about <laughs> camping. Forget that. So I woke up in the hotel morning, at a hotel room that morning, and I thought, I can't make it. So I went to the bathroom. I threw some cold water in my face, and when I looked up at the medicine cabinet, Harriet's face was there. And she said, get up and get this done. And from that, from those days on, it took, took us eight days. I just felt like I was being carried by the ancestors. Mm -hmm. And I made it across the line to Kenneth Square and then on to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So, Harry Tubman, and I did this during the day. We walked into the night, but she walked at night. She couldn't walk during the day. They used the light of the sky, the North Star. And if the nights were cloudy, she knew that if the moss was growing on the right side of the tree, the field, um, that she was going to Genius, we are geniuses. They tell us these things about ourselves because it's a way of controlling us. So you know your history and honor the ancestors. So um, I'm going to do a song that I really like. Um, when I talked about the shoes, I had five pairs of shoes. I could change my shoe with that pattern. One of the ladies who did not walk with us, she carried all of our gear. So if we needed snacks or to change our shoes, we could get it. Carrie didn't have that. But one of the code songs is called, I Got Shoes. How am I doing with time? Not long. Not okay. I gotta accelerate this thing. You all have to, let me just say this thing. You gotta come to Cambridge, come to my museum. I will take you on a walk along the But I got shoes. It's another song.
part of the lyric said, we can crack the earth's foundation with our love. So we end with this song. Um, it's a Presbyterian song. Oh, sorry. Presbyterian <laughs> song. <laughs> Oh.